Okay, um, morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, we're going to do the whole of the foundation paper for physics. We realise that some of you took the higher. 40% of the questions are the same, but it does take you through the whole paper. If you are doing higher, it might give you some insight into the differences. If you're doing foundation, we're going to take you through every question you did and the thinking behind it, okay? I realise it's a long time to sit still. Do your best to keep concentrating. This is what you're going to have to do in the real thing, okay? Can you put your hand up if you want a yellow paper, please? Okay, has everyone got a paper? Okay, we'll make a start. Um, if you're... Yes. We're getting some pens. Um, in a minute, when Mrs. Fagelman comes back with the pens, if you can just put your hand up, um, she'll lend them to you. If you are wondering why I'm wearing gloves, I have a thing called Reynards. Um, if I get too cold, I lose feeling in my fingers and I can't write. So, um, that's it. Right, let's make a start. First job. Guys, if you want to remain in here, you now need to be silent. Okay, first job. Find the equation sheet on the back, detach it, put it in front of you. You have to learn most of the equations. Some of them are given, put it in front of you. And can you all now turn to question one on page two? Yosef, you need to stop talking now.
Okay, question one. Student investigated how the pressure of gas varied with the volume of the gas. So this is stuff about Boyle's law. The mass and the temperature of the gas were constant. So figure one shows the equipment. We've got a syringe and a pressure gauge. What is the range of the syringe? So the range of a piece of equipment is what is the maximum it can measure? What can it measure? So the range, if you look, goes up to 25 centimetres cubed. So the range is not to 25. So you need to put a tick, not to 25. Again, tick one box. If you don't know, tick one box anyway. What type of variable was the mass of the gas? If you can sort out what types of variables things are, you probably get four or five different questions right. So the control variable is always the thing you keep the same. So the mass of the gas, it told you in the question, the mass of the gas and the temperature were constant. So that's the thing that is staying the same. So it is the control variable. It is not the dependent variable. The dependent variable is the thing that is being tested. And the independent variable is the thing that you change. Okay, we get, go on to get a graph. And it says the student compressed the gas in the syringe, so he pushed the plunger down and read the pressure from the pressure gauge. Figure two shows his results, so this is his results here. He concluded that when the pressure was multiplied by the corresponding volume, so the pressure was multiplied by the volume, the answer was the same. So how am I gonna prove that? Well, let's look at two different points and see if they come out the same. So, I would use a ruler, let's go for 200. So, and we will go for 10 because it's an easy number. So we'll take two readings off the graph. I could take them anywhere. This is what I've chosen. We just need to prove that they're the same. So, pressure. Times volume is a constant. That's what I'm trying to prove. So for A, I've got 200 times, on the bottom, 8. So that's my pressure times volume, which equals... One thousand six hundred. So now let's look at B. I've got one hundred and sixty times ten on the bottom, and I can do that in my head. So that's sixteen hundred, and they are the same. So I have proved that. The conclusion was correct. Question 1.4. Complete the sentences. Choose the answers from the words in the box. So these are the words that I need to choose. When the gas is compressed, 
the volume of the gas in the syringe and it decreases. The volume becomes smaller because I'm compressing it. So the number of collisions each second between the gas particles inside the syringe and the inside surface of the syringe increases. So as I compress something, it gets into a smaller space, all the particles are going to hit each other more often. So this means the force exerted on the inside surface of the container increases. So we've increased the pressure, there is more force. Question two, circuits. Why can I circuit? Um, figure sheet three shows the circuit used to obtain the data needed to plot the current potential difference graph for a filament lamp. Remember, potential difference is the same as voltage. And it is measured in volts. Okay. Why is component M included in the circuit? Component M, this one, is a variable resistor. Okay, why have I included a variable resistor in the circuit? Because I need to change something. So, is it to keep the current constant? No, it's variable, it's to change something, so it's not that. Is it to keep the potential difference constant? No, I want to change something, it's not that. So to vary the current. And it says, why does the resistance of the lamp increase as the potential difference across the lamp increases? What happens to a lamp as it's been on for a while, it gets hot. As it gets hot, the resistance changes. So the temperature of... Now the bit inside the bulb that gets hot is called the filament. If you said temperature of the bulb increases, that is also okay. So the resistance changes because the temperature increases. If you ever get a question about bulbs, it's normally something to do with them getting hot. Potential difference across the lamp is 12 volts. So... Here, this voltmeter is me reading 12 volts. That's what that's telling you. Calculate the energy transferred by the lamp when 8.5 coulombs of charge flow through the lamp. And they give you the equation. This is a gift. Even if you know nothing about these things, they've given you the equation. So it says calculate the energy... Energy is charge times potential difference. The charge is 8.5. The potential difference is 12. So it will be 8.5 times 12. Which is 102. And they've given you the units, so you don't have to worry about those. So questions like this, if they give you the equation, even if you don't know anything else, do them. Two point four. The 
table gives data about two types of lamp that householders may use in their homes. They might use a halogen lamp or an LED lamp. Halogen lamps are only 10% efficient. 10% efficiency is rubbish. The higher the efficiency, the better it is. And it has a lifetime of 2,000 hours. Average, mean. The LED lamp is 90% efficient. That's pretty good. And a mean lifetime of 36,000 hours. Both types of lamp produce the same amount of light. Describe the advantages for the environment of using the LED lamp compared to the halogen. So, two advantages. One, it wastes less energy. Because it's 90% efficient, it's only wasting 10%. And the longer lifetime means I don't have to replace it. So, don't have to replace as often. Question three. A student investigated the properties of three insulating materials. Figure four shows the apparatus the student used. So he's got a metal can. Inside the metal can is hot water. He has a thermometer to measure the temperature. And the metal can is insulated. He also appears to have a lid on it. In the investigation, different insulating materials were used to insulate a metal can filled with hot water. So the thing they're going to change is these insulating materials here. Everything else is what they're going to keep the same. And we've got another graph. The graph shows how the temperature measured by the thermometer changed over 25 minutes for each of the materials. So here's my time, 25 minutes. Um, it's been a very exciting experiment watching water cool for 25 minutes. And they're just recording the temperature. So, what was the temperature of the room <coughs> where the student carried out the investigation. How am I going to figure out room temperature? The way I'm going to do it is that material C, this one here, cooled down here to 20 degrees and didn't get any colder. So obviously the temperature of the surroundings, the temperature of the room was 20 degrees, okay? None of the others made it there. They didn't get cold enough. So it's this one we need to look at. So the temperature of the room was 20 degrees. And again, it says tick one box. If you don't know, tick one box. <coughs> Material C, so the bottom one again, has the highest thermal conductivity. How does the graph show this? So, 
we look at the graph, material C goes from 80 degrees down to 20 degrees. That is the highest temperature change or the biggest temperature decrease. Another student repeated the investigation using the equipment shown in figure six. So he's also got a thermometer in each one. He's also got insulation round each one. He's got hot water in a metal can. So the thing that is different is the thickness of the insulation. Here it's thin, here it is thick. So suggest how using this equipment will affect the results, the insulation is thicker and it's two marks. They want me to say more than one thing. So the temperature decrease will be slower. Students could have used a temperature probe and data logger instead of a thermometer. Figure 7 shows the data logger screen, so that's the data logger screen. Nice little digital readout and a magnified view of the thermometer. So complete the sentences below. Again, choose words from the box. Compared to the thermometer, the data logger and temperature probe has a resolution that is higher. So this tells us 38.7 degrees, so this is an accuracy, a resolution of 0.1 of a degree. Um, the thermometer, you cannot read it that accurately. And compared to the thermometer, the chance of misreading the data logger and temperature probe is lower. <coughs> this digital readout is much, much easier to read than the reading on the thermometer. So this table gives information about four types of insulation that could be used in the walls of houses. We've got felt wool, mineral wool, polyurethane foam 
and rock wall. And it gives us the thermal conductivity of each. <coughs> Which type of insulation would be most effective in reducing the rate of cooling of a building? So if, if you're reducing the rate of cooling, the one that is the best, the one that keeps it the warmest. So let's have a look. So we've got 0 0.07, 0 0.04, 0 0.03, 0 0.045. So 0 0.03 is the smallest. So in our box, we need to tick the polyurethane film, foam. <coughs> Give a reason, it has the lowest thermal conductivity. Okay, we're on to static electricity, question four. A student used some everyday items to investigate static electricity. Figure eight shows a flexible plastic strip being rubbed with a cloth. We all did this in year seven. Complete the sentence. Choose answers again from the box. Rubbing the plastic strip with the cloth causes the strip to become negatively charged because something moves from the cloth onto the plastic. We've got a choice of electrons, neutrons or protons. It is electrons. And electrons are negative. So again, choosing answers from the box, the cloth is left with a positive charge. The student hung the plastic strip over a wooden rod. The ends of the strip moved away from each other. Figure 9 shows the position of the plastic strip on the wooden rod. What two conclusions should the student make about the forces acting on the two halves of the strip? So the two halves of the strip are pushing away from each other. So they are repelling. If there was no charge, it would look like that. If they were attracting, they would touch. So they are repelling. So you can say they are repulsive or repelling or forces acting in the opposite direction. The other thing you can say, it's two marks, 
two answers is that the forces are equal. They are pushing away the same amount. So that distance is the same as that distance. They are equal forces. So forces are Forces are equal size. So they're repelling and they're equal. Another student repeated the experiment using the same method and found that the plastic strip moved in the same way. Complete the sentence, answers from the box. So the investigation was an anomaly. That doesn't make sense. Definitely not that. So we're left with repeatable and reproducible. Repeatable means same person, same method. Reproducible means same result, but different person or method or technique. However you spell technique. So, the investigation, it was another student, so it must be reproducible. And again, this is one of the things that you need to learn. What's repeatable, what's reproducible. Get them in your head probably three or four marks in there over the papers. Okay, the chemistry question that we threw in there to confuse you. <coughs> Miss Middleton, most of them got it wrong, I'm so sorry. Figure 10 shows a lithium atom. What is the mass number of this lithium atom? The mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. It's the total sum of things that weigh something. So it is 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Count the things that weigh something. The mass means weight. And the atomic number is the number of protons. So, number of protons, one, two, three. It is three. Reason, it is the number of protons. It is also the number <coughs> of electrons, but they're looking for you to say the number of protons, okay? Just because this crops up in a physics exam, do not forget all the chemistry you've ever learned. <coughs> Complete the sentence, answers from the box again. The electrons in the atom orbit in different energy what? So what they're asking is, what are these things called? And the answer they're looking for is levels.
5.4 radioactive decay. Some atomic nuclei are unstable and decay by emitting an alpha particle or a beta particle. Complete the symbols for an alpha particle and a beta particle. Use answers from the box. So alpha emits a helium atom. Helium is 4, 2. So every time it decays, it emits a helium atom. Beta releases one fast-moving electron. So it loses a negative. It loses an electron. And where some of the previous questions you could work it out, these are things that you just need to know. Have a guess if you don't, but these are things you need to know. Okay, so we're looking at the uses of radiation next. Doctors may use nuclear radiation to diagnose certain types of illnesses. Table 3 gives data about three radiation sources used. Each source emits beta radiation. Why is oxygen 15, so this one, likely to pose the least risk to a patient? And the reason is it has the shortest half-life. It decays quicker. So the exposure to radi radiation is shorter. If something, someone was going to inject something radioactive into me, I'd want it to be gone as quickly as possible. So it is a shorter half-life. So exposure to radiation is shorter. Two marks, two things. We're back to circuits. Question six. Solar cells produce electricity using light from the sun. The symbol for a solar cell is, um, so it's a cell with two little lights coming in. This is a light going in to represent the light from the sun. A householder has three solar cells. Each solar cell has an output potential difference. Remember, potential difference is voltage of 0.7 volts. Which arrangement of three solar cells will give a potential difference of 2.1 volts? So I need three all working together. 0.7 plus 0.7 plus 0.7 is going to give me that. So in order to work together, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 7, that is going to give me 2.1 volts. Let's check it. This one, got the two minuses connected together, it is not going to work. This one, we've got two pluses connected together. It is not going to work. Back to year seven, when you connected circuits up, if you get the batteries the wrong way round, they do not work. Is 
6.2, a solar cell has resistance of 2.5 ohms when the output potential difference is 0.7 volts. Calculate the current through the solar cell. The examiners have been very, very kind. Once again, they've given you the equation. So even if you don't know how to do this, they've given you the equation. Substitute the numbers in. So current is potential difference over resistance, which is 0.7 divided by resistance, which is 2.5. So 0 0.7 divided by 2, whoops, start again, 0 0.7 divided by 2.5 is 0.28, and again, you've been given the units, you don't even have to worry about them. Figure 11 shows a graph of current against potential difference for a different type of solar cell. So we have current here, potential difference here. It says the power output of the cell is calculated using the equation power is current times potential difference, P equals IV. What value of potential difference on figure 11 gives the maximum power of the solar cell? So this is where we need to start working things out. At 0.1 volts, got 0.1 and it's at 0.9. So here, 0 0.1 times 0 0.9 equals 0 0.09. This is a bit fiddly. At 0.3 volts, so 0.3 volts, again, we are at 0.9. So 0.3 volts, 0.3 times 0.9, which is 0.27. So that's bigger than that one, so that one's looking good so far. 0.6 volts. This question's actually making us work for our marks. 0.6 volts. And here, use your ruler if you need to, 0.6 volts, it's not so easy to read. So draw lines on the graph, that's absolutely fine. So here, this is 0.86. So at 0.6 volts, we have 0.6 times 0.86. Can't do that one in my head. That's 0.51. That's the biggest so far. One more to try. And at 0.7 volts, ah, nothing. So 0.7 times nothing is nothing. So let's read the question again now we've worked them out. Which value of potential difference gives the maximum, so the biggest power output? So the biggest one is this one. It is 0 0.51. That is the biggest number. And why? It is the largest 
power when calculated. I'll do a second on that as complicated. So, so far for me, that's the worst two marks of the paper. That's made me do a bit of work there. I had to think. Not keen on that. Six point four. Write down the equation that links efficiency, total power input, and useful power output. This is one of the equations you have to learn. If you have not learnt it, write down some equation that involves all three you might get it right but the equation is efficiency again they're not bothered about your spelling although you could copy it from there is useful power out divided by total power in Then it says, the total power input is 2.4 watts when the efficiency is 0 0.2. Calculate the useful power output of the cell. It's starting to make you work now. We need to rearrange this equation. So, efficiency is useful out over total in. I want to calculate this. That's what I want to make the subject of the formula. So I need to divide both sides by total power in to get rid of it from there. So so it will be efficiency times total in which is the efficiency is 0.2. Total power in is 2.4. And 2.4, because it's got decimal points in it, let's do it with a calculator, make sure we get it right. So 0.2 times 2.4 is 0.48 and they've given you the units watts. the examiners are getting modern they found a drone so this is a picture of a battery powered drone complete the sentence again we're looking for answers from the box so as the drone accelerates upwards so if we're flying our drone as it is accelerating up into the sky what energy increases so the higher it gets, the more gravitational potential energy it gets. OK, 
So this is gravitational energy. This is gravitational potential energy. That's gravitational energy. It's still flying, so it's potential. It can drop to the floor. It's not done so. What energy is increasing? Its movement is increasing. Its kinetic energy is increasing. As it's accelerating, its movement energy, its kinetic energy is increasing. And the watt energy store of the battery decreases. The kind of energy in a battery is chemical energy. Again, if we were going to make some guesses, if we didn't know, um, there is nothing about drones that includes nuclear energy. That is a stupid answer. So at least you've got a one in four chance of getting it right. Okay, in the USA... Drones are not allowed to be flown too high above the ground. Suggest one possible risk of flying a drone too high above the ground. There are thousands. The most common ones are might hit a plane and damage it or cause it to crash, might fall, damage something. So any logical explanation. So I'm going to say might hit a plane and cause crash. Let's be dramatic. It's one mark, so I only need to say one thing. Seven point three. Write down the equation again. Memory banks required. Energy transfer, power, and time. So energy transfer equals power times time. If you wrote E equals P T, you would also get the mark. So make sure you get the symbols right. Make sure you use capital letters correctly if that's what you're going to do. I would say it's safer to write the words because they give you the words. Again, if you don't know, guess. And then they ask you to use the equation you've just pulled out of your head. Um, again, if you get this equation wrong, so if you've guessed or you get it wrong, but then you do a calculation, they will give you the marks from the equation you have used. So even if you're not sure, bang on, chuck some values in, they will give you the marks for what, you, what equation you have used. So this is the right equation. So the drone can fly for 25 minutes. An alarm bell has just gone off. We do not calculate anything in minutes in science. We need to change it to seconds. So as soon as I see minutes, I think, oh, I need to do something with that. So it flies for 25 minutes before the battery needs recharging. The power of the battery is 65 watts. Calculate the maximum energy. So Energy, we don't have to rearrange the equation, is power times time. 25 minutes is 25 times 60 seconds. Let's not leave it to chance. We'll use the old calculator. 25 times 60 is 1,500 seconds. 
So back to our equation, power, 65 watts, times time in seconds, 1500. Again, we'll use the calculator, 65 times 1500 equals 97500. And again, they've given us the units. They will not always do this. Make sure you know them. Sometimes you get a mark for getting the units right. Question eight, back to radiation. Sources of background radiation are either natural or man-made. Which two sources are natural? So, cosmic rays. Can men make cosmic rays? No. So, cosmic rays are natural. Medical x-rays, they are not natural. They are man-made, that is no good. Nuclear power stations are man-made. Nuclear weapons, weapons testing is man-made. A radon gas, even if you don't know what it is, is a natural source. So... James Bond stuff now, background radiation. A teacher used a Geiger-Muller tube or a Geiger counter to measure the background radiation in his laboratory. This shows the equipment, the Geiger-Muller tube and the counter. Okay, so it's a digital readout. That's all we need to know. Table four gives three readings taken by the teacher at three different times on the same day. So we've got 16 counts in a minute, 21 counts in a minute, and 18 counts in a minute. He will not ch uh, kill the children. These are low doses. Why are the readings going to be different? So, radioactive decay is a random process. Yes, it is. Let's look at the rest just to check. Air pressure in the laboratory increases. Air pressure is nothing to do with radiation. It's not that. Background radiation increased <coughs> during the day. Well, if you look at the table, it didn't. And the temperature decreased. Again, nothing to do with it. Radioactive decay is a random process. That's why they varied. Okay, so the teacher takes a radioactive source from a storage box. We're not allowed to do that, but this teacher is. Um, Figure 14 shows the box, and the box has a lead lining. Why does storing the radioactive source in a box, or in this box, reduce the risk of radiation exposure to the teacher? So what's special about the box? The lead lining absorbs the emitted radiation. So as the radioactive source decays, the lead absorbs the radiation. Let's check the others. The lead lining reflects the radiation, but it's still going to be there, isn't it, if it reflects, so that's no good. 
and transmits the radiation. That's even worse. We don't want it transmitted. So it's definitely not that. So we check our answer, make sure it's sensible. Okay, they've shown us the Geiger-Muller tube again. So the teacher uses the tube and counter to measure the radiation emitted from the radioactive source. So there's our source now out of its little box. The counter was reset to zero and after one minute it was 159. Shows it there. How should the teacher calculate the counts from the radioactive source? So, what they're trying to get you to do here is think about the difference between the radiation that has come from this radioactive source and the background radiation. So, this will be measuring both. It can't tell whether the radiation it's measuring is from this source or from background radiation. So, am I going to add the background count to 159? No, because that includes it. So that's not right. Divide it by 159? No, makes no sense. Multiply, again, makes no sense. I'm going to subtract the background count from 159 because the 159 includes background radiation. teacher passed the radiation through an electric field. Figure 16 shows the path that the radiation took. So the electric field has got a plus and a minus and it shows that the radiation is attracted to the plus. That's why it veers off there. If it was attracted to the minus, it would go that way. If it wasn't attracted to either of them, it would be a straight line. It's definitely being attracted to the positive side up here. So it's which type of radiation was being emitted, um, emitted by the radioactive source? And it is beta because beta is negatively charged. So attracted to positive plate. nice blank page. Question nine. Most electric kettles use the AC mains electricity supply. So the normal three pin plug, that's what it means. Complete the sentence. The AC mains supply has a potential difference of voltage that continuously what polarity? So the mains is 230 volts and it goes from plus to minus so it continually changes and it's AC alternating that's what gives you the clue if you can't remember changes polarity means it goes from plus to minus
now we have a picture of three pretty kettles. A student investigated how the power output of a kettle affected the time taken to boil for a fixed volume of water. The water in all three kettles had an initial temperature of 25 degrees. So we've got 2,500 watts, 1,800 watts, and 2.8 kilowatts. So kilowatts is 1,000 watts. So this is the big one. What type of variable was the time? So let's go back to the question. He investigated how the power output affected the time. So the control variable is the thing you keep the same, so it's not that. We're looking at what it does to the time. The dependent variable is the thing being tested. In the question it says, He's investigating the time. So that is the thing he is investigating. So it's the dependent variable. The independent variable is the thing you change. He is not changing the time. So it's definitely not that. And which kettle will boil the water in the shortest time? So, got our three kettles. 2,500 watts, 1,800 watts, and 2.8 kilowatts. This is the one with the most power. So, kettle C, and it's 2.8 kilowatts equals... 2,800 watts, so most power. Or highest power. Another graph. Okay. Figure 18 shows the amount of energy transferred by the kettle varies with time. So this is time in seconds. We're happy with seconds. We don't need to change anything. Energy in joules. Happy with that. Okay. So power is given by the gradient of the graph. So the gradient is how steep it is. This would be more power. This would be less power. So how steep the graph is. Calculate the power output of the kettle. So what it's saying is, calculate the gradient of the line. So I'm going to pick a value here. You can do this anywhere because it's a straight line. But at 50,000 joules, it is 22 and a half seconds. So gradient is vertical divided by horizontal. So that will be, that's 50,000 and that's 22.5. So that's 50 divided by 22.5 let's not leave it to chance fifty thousand divided by twenty two point five is two 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 watts if you ever get hold of the mark scheme it says three thousand watts I have no clue why
Back to the memory banks. Write down the equation that links charge flow, current and time. So charge equals current times time or Q equals I T. Guys, learn your equations. And again, it asks you to use the equation you've just remembered. So calculate the current through the kettle when 2,400 coulombs of charge flows in 250 seconds. We're happy with seconds. We're happy with coulombs. We need to rearrange the formula. We need to calculate the current. So Q equals I T. To get I as the subject, I need to divide both sides by T. So I've just rearranged that formula. The charge is 2,400. The time is 250 seconds. So 2,400 divided by 250 is 9.6 and again they've given you the units Every physics exam in the world has a question about throwing tennis balls around. Physics teachers are fascinated by tennis balls for some reason. So, figure 19 shows a tennis ball being thrown vertically into the air. So, literally, throwing a tennis ball up in the air. At position C, so, well, it's just um, in the guy's hand. It's, so the ball has just left his hand at a speed of 5 metres per second. So just as he's let go, it's at 5 metres per second. It has a mass of 0 0.058 kilograms. Write down the equation that links kinetic energy, mass and speed. This is a hard one to guess, but kinetic energy is half times mass times, they say speed, but we all learn it as velocity. So, velocity squared. So it's half mv squared. So I think it's a bit mean putting speed in there because when we learn this equation, we always use velocity. Oops. Calculate the kinetic energy of the tennis ball at position C. So, Let's write the equation down again. It's half mv squared. So at position C, the mass is 0.058, and the velocity is 5 meters per second. And it's squared. So 5 squared is 25. So I've got half times 
0.058 times 5 squared, which is 25. I've got 0 0.725 joules. It doesn't say anything about standard form, decimal places, whatever, so we'll just write the whole answer down. Okay, at position A, so that's the very top, the tennis ball is its maximum height. What is the gravitational potential energy of the tennis ball at position A? Ignore air resistance. Good. So at position A, when it is at the top, all of the energy that has been used to throw it into the air has the potential to come down again. So it's kinetic energy when it's right at the top, gets transferred to gravitational potential to come down. So it's literally 0 0.725 joules. And what goes up must come down. Same amount of energy. Can't create or destroy it. Okay, at position B, so halfway up, the tennis ball has 0 0.38 joules of gravitational potential energy. So that's halfway up, that's what it could come down with. Write down the equation that links gravitational field strength, gravitational potential energy, height and mass. So gravitational potential energy is mass times gravitational field strength times height or E P equals M G H And it says, calculate the height of the tennis ball above the tennis player's hand at position B. Gravitational field strength is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So, we need the height. We need to rearrange this equation. So, GPE is MGH. And you'll notice I keep writing the equation down every time. If I make a mistake rearranging it, the examiner can see what I've done. If I just suddenly start putting numbers everywhere, they've got no idea if I know what I'm doing. Okay? So let's rearrange it now. We want the height. So I want height as the subject. So I need to divide both sides by M and G. So it's E, P, divided by... I'm looking for high M G. So we have not point three eight, which is the gravitational potential energy at position B. That's where I've got that from. Divided by the mass, which, back to the question, this is quite complicated, so the mass again, this is where it gives it to you, so 0 0.58, 0 0.058 times gravitational field strength, which is 9.8. So 0 0.38 divided by, I'm going to use the brackets on my calculator, 0 0.058 times 9.8, it's 
So I've got 0.6685, da 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 da. So I'm going to put 0.67. Again, it doesn't say anything about decimal places, standard form. Okay, the renewable energy question, you always get one. Wind turbines in a wind farm must have a maximum distance of 500 metres between them for maximum efficiency. Figure 20 shows the position of nine wind turbines in a wind farm. And each one has 500 metres between them. So it is an efficient wind farm. This suggests one way in which the layout of the wind farm ensures maximum efficiency when the wind direction changes. So it's got to work in all different wind directions. So back to the question, it says for maximum efficiency they need to be 500 metres between them. So our answer for one mark is the minimum distance 500 meters between in all directions The average mass of air passing through the blades of one wind turbine is 51,000 kilograms per second. A lot of air. The density of air is 1.2 kilogram per meter cubed. Write down the equation. There is a theme forming. Learn your equations. That links density, mass and volume. Density equals mass divided by volume, or rho, it's not a P, it's the Greek symbol rho, I think it's Greek, is M over V. Calculate the volume of air passing through the blades of one wind turbine per second. Give the unit Give your answer to two significant figures. So now they're getting fussy. Go back to our equation. So rho equals mass divided by volume. They've asked us to calculate the volume, so again, I need to rearrange it. So volume is mass over density. So my mass is, go back to the question, here, 51,000, and the density of air is 1.2. Let's go back and check it. We're talking about kilograms and metres here. We're talking about kilograms here. We don't have to convert any units. So 51,000 divided by 1.2 
is 42,500. Back to the question. Two significant figures. So in my answer box, I am writing 43,000, two significant figures. And my unit for volume is meters cubed. Average power output from one of the wind turbines is 1.6 times 10 to the 6 watts. The average power output of a nuclear power station is 2.4 times 10 to the 9 watts. Calculate the number of wind turbines needed to generate power equal to one nuclear power station. So I need to divide the number of, um, for the nuclear power station, so 2.4 times 10 to the 9, divided by 1.6 times 10 to the 6. This is testing whether you can... Um, calculate with the um, exponentials. So on your calculator, make sure you know how to put the powers in and work with them. We are not doing 2.4 times 10 times 9 times, yeah? We're doing times 10 to the power 9. So on my, my calculator, it's very straightforward. So 2.4 and we've got the times 10 to the something button. So that times 10 to the 9 divided by 1.6 times 10 to the 6. If you don't know how to do it on your calculator, learn or get a new calculator. Or go and beg someone in maths to help you. So the answer is 1,500. So 1,500 wind turbines equals one nuclear power station. It's a lot of wind turbines. Okay. The UK requires a minimum electrical power of 2.5 times 10 to the 10 watts at any time. That is a lot of power. Give two reasons why wind turbines alone are unlikely to be used to meet this requirement. Problem with wind turbines, it is not always windy. So all this stuff about how many watts we need is totally irrelevant. Problem with wind turbines, not always windy. The other problem, we do need this data this time, 2.5 times 10 to the 10 watts, you'd need too many wind turbines. You'd be weaving in and out of them on your way to school, there would be so many, so you would need too many. Guys, we're nearly there. OK. 
Okay. When your lovely teachers are telling you about um, doing the, what are they called? The what's the experiments? The ones we have to do? Required practicals. Thank you. When we're talking about required practicals, this is the kind of question you might be asked about one. So one of your required practicals is about specific heat capacity of aluminium. And you should have or you will have done this in physics by the time you come to sit your GCSE. So draw a labelled diagram showing how the apparatus used to determine the specific heat capacity of aluminium should be arranged. So it's asking you to draw a diagram and this is the equipment that we would use. Please forgive my rubbish drawing. So I have an aluminium block and the school aluminium blocks are little cylinders of aluminium. If you remember doing the experiment, they're about that tall, about that round, shiny metal. And they have two holes in the top. So this is my aluminium block. Two holes in the top, there is a thicker hole which you put a heater into. That's what makes it hot, that's how you can tell the um, specific heat capacity. So that is an immersion heater. The other hole is for a thermometer. So, it's a slightly smaller hole and there is a very poorly drawn thermometer. Let's put some little, there we go. Looks a bit more like a thermometer now. Okay, we need to insulate it. So let's draw. an insulator. And the immersion heater is connected to a, it has two wires. It has a voltmeter across it. We need to measure the voltage and we need to measure the current in the circuit. And we have a power supply. The other things we need, and this is where your equation sheet comes in, It's asked you to calculate the specific heat capacity or talk about specific heat capacity. That is one of the equations they give you. I think. There we are, yep. So this equation here tells you all the things you need to calculate specific heat capacity. So I've got my little experiment now. Can I tell the change in thermal energy? Yep, I've got a thermometer. Can I tell the mass of the aluminium block? No. So I need a balance. I need to weigh it. Specific heat capacity is the thing I'm trying to find out. So it's okay not to know that. Temperature change. Again, I can find it out. I can do that. The other thing I need to do is have a stop clock. So, however you want to draw it. So all that for three marks, it's quite a lot to do.
Everyone got that? The dreaded six mark question. Again, they are not looking for you to write beautiful sentences, nice English, good spelling, any of that stuff. It says, describe how you could use the apparatus to determine the specific heat capacity of aluminium. So, connect equipment as diagram. And I need to prove specific heat capacity is, that's the equation. So, I got given it here, but because this is the toughest question on the paper, I have to rearrange it as well. Okay? So the next thing I need to do is calculate the energy. Energy is power times time. But I don't know the power. I don't know the power of my heater. I know the voltage and the current. So to get the power, it is OK. So back to my beautiful circuit diagram. I know the voltage, I know the current, and I know the time. I weigh block to get mass. So we've got the energy there. We're getting the mass there. I find the temperature change using my thermometer. So that's my temperature change. So that's how I find out all the things I need to know. The last couple of bits. I need to talk about how I'm going to be accurate. So I would not just do this once. I would repeat for accuracy, take the mean.
and I might also mention that risk assessment don't touch hot bits. That is a tough, tough question. But even if you only put three or four of these things down, you're still going to get some marks. If you have time at the end, try and write down as many of these things as you can. Okay, this is the last question. Oh, no, not quite. Last little bit. Here we go. Methods used to determine specific heat capacity of aluminium may give a value greater than the actual value. Why? So some of the thermal energy might be transferred to the surroundings. So if I've got my little aluminium cylinder and its little insulating jacket, that insulator might not be 100% efficient. So some of the energy might get transferred to my classroom. So what might that do? So temperature change, not as high as it should be. Right guys, thank you very much for listening, thank you for being quiet.